The Odyssey of Homer. Book 23. Odysseus maketh himself known to Penelope, tells his adventures briefly, and in the morning goes to Let's and makes himself known to him. Then the ancient woman went up into the upper chamber laughing aloud, to tell her mistress how her dear lord was within, and her knees moved fast for joy, and her feet stumbled one over the other, and she stood above the lady's head and spake to her, saying, Awake, Penelope, dear child, that thou mayest see with thine own eyes that which thou desirest day by day. Odysseus hath come, and hath got him to his own house, though late hath he come, and hath slain the proud wars that troubled his house, and devoured his substance, and oppressed his child. Then wise Penelope answered her, Dear nurse, the gods have made thee distraught, the gods that can make foolish even the wisdom of the wise, and that stablish the simple in understanding. They it is that have marred thy reason, though heretofore thou hadst a prudent heart. Why dost thou mock me, who have a spirit full of sorrow, to speak these wild words, and rousest me out of sweet slumber, that had bound me and overshadowed mine eyelids? Never yet have I slept so sound since the day that Odysseus went forth to see that evil Ilios, never to be named. Go to now, get thee down and back to the women's chamber, for if any other of the maids of my house had come and brought me such tidings, and wakened me from sleep, straightway would I have sent her back woefully to return within the women's chamber, but this time thine old age shall stand thee in good stead. Then the good nurse Eurycleia answered her, I mock thee not, dear child, but in very deed Odysseus is here, and hath come home, even as I tell thee. He is that guest on whom all men wrought such dishonor in the halls. But long ago Telemachus was ware of him, that he was within the house, yet in his prudence he hid the counsels of his father, that he might take vengeance on the violence of the haughty wars. Thus she spake, and then was Penelope glad, and leaping from her bed she fell on the old woman's neck, and let fall the tears from her eyelids, and uttering her voice spake to her winged words, Come, dear nurse, I pray thee, tell me all truly, if indeed he hath come home as thou sayest, how he hath laid his hands on the shameless wars, he being but one man, while they abode ever in their companies within the house. Then the good nurse Eurycleia answered her, I saw not, I wist not, only I heard the groaning of men slain. And we in an inmost place of the well-builded chambers sat all amazed, and the close-fitted doors shut in the room, till thy son called me from the chamber, for his father sent him out to that end. Then I found Odysseus standing among the slain, who around him, stretched on the hard floor, lay one upon the other, it would have comforted thy heart to see him, all stained like a lion with blood and soil of battle. And now all the wolves gathered in and heap by the gates of the court, while he is purifying his fair house with brimstone, and hath kindled a great fire, and hath sent me forth to call thee. So come with me, that ye may both enter into your heart's delight, for ye have suffered much affliction. And even now hath this thy long desire been fulfilled, thy lord hath come alive to his own hearth, and hath found both thee and his son in the halls, and the wars that wrought him evil he hath slain, every man of them in his house. Then wise Penelope answered her, Dear nurse, boast not yet over them with laughter. Thou knowest how welcome the sight of him would be in the halls to all, and to me in chief, and to his son that we got between us. But this is no true tale, as thou declarest it, nay, but it is one of the deathless gods that hath slain the proud wars, in wrath at their bitter insolence and evil deeds. For they honoured none of earthly men, neither the good nor yet the bad, that came among them. Wherefore they have suffered an evil doom through their own infatuate deeds. But Odysseus, far away hath lost his homeward path to the Achaean land, and himself is lost. Then the good nurse Eurycleia made answer to her, My child, what would have escaped the door of thy lips, in that thou saidest that thy lord, who is even now within, and by his own hearthstone, would return no more? Nay, thy heart is ever hard of belief. Go to now, and I will tell thee besides a most manifest token, even the scar of the wound that the boar on a time dealt him with his white tusk. This I spied while washing his feet, and fain I would have told it even to thee, but he laid his hand on my mouth, and in the fullness of his wisdom suffered me not to speak. But come with me and I will stake my life on it, and if I play thee false, do thou slay me by a death most pitiful. Then wise Penelope made answer to her, Dear nurse, it is hard for thee, how wise soever, to observe the purposes of the everlasting gods. Nonetheless let us go to my child, that I may see the wolves dead, and him that slew them. With that word she went down from the upper chamber, and much her heart debated, whether she should stand apart, and question her dear lord or draw nigh, and clasp and kiss his head and hands. 
but when she had come within and had crossed the threshold of stone, she sat down over against Odysseus, in the light of the fire, by the further wall. Now he was sitting by the tall pillar, looking down and waiting to know if perchance his noble wife would speak to him, when her eyes beheld him. But she sat long in silence, and amazement came upon her soul, and now she would look upon him steadfastly with her eyes, and now again she knew him not, for that he was clad in vile raiment. And Telemachus rebuked her, and spake and hailed her. Mother mine, ill mother, of an ungentle heart, why turnest thou thus away from my father, and dost not sit by him, and question him, and ask him all? No other woman in the world would harden her heart to stand thus aloof from her lord, who after much travail and sore had come to her in the twentieth year to his own country. But thy heart is ever harder than stone. Then wise Penelope answered him, saying, Child, my mind is amazed within me, and I have no strength to speak, nor to ask him aught, nay, nor to look on him face to face. But if in truth this be Odysseus, and he hath indeed come home, verily we shall be ware of each other the more surely, for we have tokens that we twain know, even we, secret from all others. So she spake, and the steadfast goodly Odysseus smiled, and quickly he spake to Telemachus winged words, Telemachus, leave now thy mother to make trial of me within the chambers, so shall she soon come to a better knowledge than heretofore. But now I go filthy, and am clad in vile raiment, wherefore she has me in dishonour, and as yet will not allow that I am he. Let us then advise us how all may be for the very best. For whoso has slain but one man in a land, even that one leaves not many behind him to take up the feud for him, turns outlaw and leads his kindred and his own country, but we have slain the very stay of the city, the men who were far the best of all the noble youths in Ithaca. So this I bid thee consider. Then wise Telemachus answered him, saying, Father, see thou to this, for they say that thy counsel is far the best among men, nor might any other of mortal men contend with thee. But right eagerly will we go with thee now, and I think we shall not lack prowess, so far as might is ours. And Odysseus of many counsels answered him saying, Yea now, I will tell on what wise methinks it is best. First, go ye to the bath and array you in your doublets, and bid the maidens in the chambers to take to them their garments. Then let the divine minstrel, with his loud lyre in hand, lead off for us the measure of the mirthful dance. So shall any man that hears the sound from without, whether a wayfarer or one of those that dwell around, say that it is a wedding feast. And thus the slaughter of the wars shall not be noised abroad through the town before we go forth to our well-wooded farmland. Thereafter shall we consider what gainful counsel the Olympian may vouchsafe us. So he spake, and they gave good ear and hearkened to him. So first they went to the bath, and arrayed them in doublets, and the women were apparelled, and the divine minstrel took the hollow harp, and aroused in them the desire of sweet song and of the happy dance. Then the great hall rang round them with the sound of the feet of dancing men and of fair-girdled women. And whoso heard it from without would say, Surely some one has wedded the queen of many wars. Hard of heart was she, nor had she courage to keep the great house of her wedded lord continually till his coming. Even so men spake, and knew not how these things were ordained. Meanwhile, the house dame Eurynome had bathed the great-hearted Odysseus within his house, and anointed him with olive oil, and cast about him a goodly mantle and a doublet. Moreover Athene shed great beauty from his head downwards, and made him greater and more mighty to behold, and from his head caused deep curling locks to flow, like the hyacinth flower. And as when some skilful man overlays gold upon silver, one that Hephaestus and Pallas Athene have taught all manner of craft, and full of grace is his handiwork, even so did Athene shed grace about his head and shoulders, and forth from the bath he came, in form like to the immortals. Then he sat down again on the high seat, whence he had arisen, over against his wife, and spake to her, saying, Strange lady, surely to thee above all womankind the Olympians have given a heart that cannot be softened. No other woman in the world would harden her heart to stand thus aloof from her husband, who after much travail and sore had come to her, in the twentieth year, to his own country. Nay come, nurse, strew a bed for me to lie all alone, for assuredly her spirit within her is as iron. Then wise Penelope answered him again, Strange man, I have no proud thoughts nor do I think scorn of thee, nor am I too greatly astonied, but I know right well what manner of man thou wert, when thou wentest forth out of Ithaca, on the long oared galley. But come, Eurycleia, spread for him the good bedstead outside the established bridal chamber that he built himself. 
Thither bring ye forth the good bedstead and cast bedding thereon, even fleeces and rugs and shining blankets. So she spake and made trial of her lord, but Odysseus in sore displeasure spake to his true wife, saying, Verily a bitter word is this, lady, that thou hast spoken. Who has set my bed otherwhere? Hard it would be for one, how skilled soever, unless a god were to come that might easily set it in another place, if so he would. But of men there is none living, howsoever strong in his youth, that could lightly upheave it, for a great token is wrought in the fashioning of the bed, and it was I that made it and none other. There was growing a bush of olive, long of leaf, and most goodly of growth, within the inner court, and the stem as large as a pillar. Round about this I built the chamber, till I had finished it, with stones close set, and I roofed it over well and added there two compacted doors fitting well. Next I sheared off all the light wood of the long-leaved olive, and rough-hewed the trunk upwards from the root, and smoothed it around with the adze, well and skillfully, and made straight the line thereto and so fashioned it into the bedpost, and I bored it all with the auger. Beginning from this bedpost, I wrought at the bedstead till I had finished it, and made it fair with inlaid work of gold and of silver and of ivory. Then I made fast therein a bright purple band of oxide. Even so I declare to thee this token, and I know not, lady, if the bedstead be yet fast in his place, or if some man has cut away the stem of the olive tree, and set the bedstead otherwhere. So he spake, and at once her knees were loosened, and her heart melted within her, as she knew the sure tokens that Odysseus showed her. Then she fell a-weeping, and ran straight toward him, and cast her hands about his neck, and kissed his head and spake, saying, Be not angry with me, Odysseus, for thou wert ever at other times the wisest of men. It is the gods that gave us sorrow, the gods who begrudged us that we should abide together, and have joy of our youth, and come to the threshold of old age. So now be not wroth with me here at nor full of indignation, because at the first, when I saw thee, I did not welcome thee straightway. For always my heart within my breast shuddered, for fear lest some man should come and deceive me with his words, for many they be that devise gainful schemes and evil. Nay even Argive Helen, daughter of Zeus, would not have lain with a stranger, and taken him for a lover, had she known that the warlike sons of the Achaeans would bring her home again to her own dear country. Howsoever, it was the god that set her upon this shameful deed, nor ever, ere that, did she lay up in her heart the thought of this folly, a bitter folly whence on us two first came sorrow. But now that thou hast told all the sure tokens of our bed, which never was seen by mortal man, save by thee and me and one maiden only, the daughter of Acta, that my father gave me ere yet I had come hither, she who kept the doors of our strong bridal chamber, even now dost thou bend my soul, all and gentle as it is. Thus she spake, and in his heart she stirred yet a greater longing to lament, and he wept as he embraced his beloved wife and true. And even as when the sight of land is welcome to swimmers, whose well-wrought ship beside and hath smitten on the deep, all driven with the wind and swelling waves, and but a remnant hath escaped the grey sea water, and swum to the shore, and their bodies are all crusted with the brine, and gladly have they set foot on land and escaped an evil end, so welcome to her was the sight of her lord, and her white arms she would never quite let go from his neck. And now would the rosy-fingered dawn have risen upon their weeping, but the goddess, grey-eyed Athene, had other thoughts. The night she held long in the utmost west, and on the other side she stayed the golden throne dawn by the stream oceanus, and suffered her not to harness the swift-footed steeds that bear light to men, lampus and phaeton, the steeds ever young, that bring the morning. Then at the last, Odysseus of many counsels spake to his wife, saying, Lady, we have not yet come to the issue of all our labours, but still there will be toil unmeasured, long and difficult, that I must needs bring to a full end. Even so the spirit of Teresias foretold to me, on that day when I went down into the house of Hades, to inquire after a returning for myself and my company. Wherefore come, lady, let us to bed, that forthwith we may take our joy of rest beneath the spell of sweet sleep. Then wise Penelope answered him, Thy bed verily shall be ready whensoever thy soul desires it, forasmuch as the gods have indeed caused thee to come back to thy established home and thine own country. But now that thou hast noted it and the god has put it into thy heart, Come, tell me of this ordeal, for methinks the day will come when I must learn it, and timely knowledge is no hurt. An Odysseus of many counsels answered her saying, Ah, why now art thou so instant with me to declare it? Yet I will tell thee all and hide naught. Howbeit thy heart shall have no joy of it, as even I myself have no pleasure therein. For Teresias bade me fare to many cities of men, carrying a shopen or in my hands, till I should come to such men as know not the sea, 
neither eat meat savoured with salt, nor have they knowledge of ships of purple cheek, nor of Chopin oars, which serve for wings to ships. And he told me this with manifest token, which I will not hide from thee. In the day when another wayfarer should meet me and say that I had a winnowing fan on my stout shoulder, even then he bade me make fast my Chopin or in the earth, and do goodly sacrifice to the Lord Poseidon, even with a ram and a bull and a boar, the mate of swine, and depart for home, and offer holy hecatoms to the deathless gods, that keep the wide heaven, to each in order due. And from the sea shall mine own death come, the gentlest death that may be, which shall end me, foredone, with smooth old age, and the folk shall dwell happily around. All this, he said, was to be fulfilled. Then wise Penelope answered him saying, If indeed the gods will bring about for thee a happier old age at the last, then is there hope that thou mayest yet have an escape from evil. Thus they spake one to the other. Meanwhile, Urinome and the nurse spread the bed with soft coverlets, by the light of the torches burning. But when they had busied them and spread the good bed, the ancient nurse went back to her chamber to lie down, and Urinome, the bower maiden, guided them on their way to the couch, with torches in her hands, and when she had led them to the bridal chamber she departed. And so they came gladly to the rites of their bed, as of old. But Telemachus and the neat herd, and the swine herd stayed their feet from dancing, and made the women to cease, and themselves gat them to rest through the shadowy halls. Now when the twain had taken their fill of sweet love, they had delight in the tales, which they told one to the other. The fair lady spoke of all that she had endured in the halls at the sight of the ruinous throng of wars, who for her sake slew many cattle, kine and goodly sheep, and many a cask of wine was broached. And in turn, Odysseus, of the seed of Zeus, recounted all the griefs he had wrought on men, and all his own travail and sorrow, and she was delighted with the story, and sweet sleep fell not upon her eyelids till the tale was ended. He began by setting forth how he overcame the Sicones, and next arrived at the rich land of the Lotus Eaters, and all that the Cyclops wrought, and what a price he got from him for the good companions that he devoured, and showed no pity. Then how he came to Aeolus, who received him gladly and sent him on his way, but it was not yet ordained that he should reach his own country, for the storm wind seized him again, and bare him over the teeming seas, making grievous moan. Next how he came to Telepolis of the Lestragonians, who brake his ships and slew all his goodly grieved companions, and Odysseus only escaped with his black ship. Then he told all the wiles and many contrivances of Circe, and how in a benched ship he fared to the dank house of Hades, to seek to the soul of the Bante Regis. There he beheld all those that had been his companions, and his mother who bore him and nurtured him, while yet he was a little one. Then how he heard the song of the full-voiced sirens, and came to the rocks wandering, and to terrible Charybdis, and to Scylla, that never yet have men avoided scatheless. Next he told how his company slew the kind of Aelios, and how Zeus, that thunders on high, smote the swift ship with the flaming bolt, and the good crew perished altogether, and he alone escaped from evil fates. And how he came to the Isle of Gigia, and to the nymph Calypso, who kept him there in her hollow caves, longing to have him for her lord, and nurtured him and said that she would make him never to know death or age all his days, yet she never won his heart within his breast. Next how with great toil he came to the Phaeacians, who gave him all worship heartily, as to a god, and sent him with a ship to his own dear country, with gifts of bronze, and of gold, and raiment in plenty. This was the last word of the tale, when sweet sleep came speedily upon him, sleep that loosens the limbs of men, and knitting the cares of his soul. Then the goddess, grey-eyed Athene, turned to new thoughts. When she deemed that Odysseus had taken his fill of love and sleep, straightway she aroused from out Oceanus the golden throne dawn, to bear light to men. Then Odysseus gat him from his soft bed, and laid this charge on his wife, saying, Lady, already have we had enough of labors, thou and I, thou, in weeping here, and longing for my troublous return, I, while Zeus and the other gods bound me fast in pain, despite my yearning after home, away from mine own country. But now that we both have come to the bed of our desire, take thou thought for the care of my wealth within the halls. But as for the sheep that the proud wolves have slain, I myself will lift many more as spoil, and others the Achaeans will give, till they fill all my folds. But now, behold, I go to the well-wooded farmland, to see my good father, who for love of me has been in sorrow continually. And this charge I lay on thee, lady, too wise though thou art to need it. Quickly will the brute go forth with the rising sun, the brute concerning the wars, whom I slew in the halls. Wherefore ascend with the women thy handmaids into the upper chamber, 
and sit there and look on no man, nor ask any question. Therewith he girded on his shoulder his goodly armor, and roused Telemachus and the neat herd and the swine herd, and bade them all take weapons of war in their hands. So they were not disobedient to his word, but clad themselves in mail, and opened the doors and went forth, and Odysseus led the way. And now there was light over all the earth, but the Methine hid in night, and quickly conducted out of the town. Thank you for watching. If you are returning to the Classic Masterworks channel, welcome back. If you are new, please don't forget to like and subscribe and hit the bell notification so that you will be made aware of our latest content.